Today we're wrapping up the series on how to not be your own worst enemy. And uh, we know that we are our own worst enemy because we've done it ourselves quite often. And uh, I think that this is particularly important because we have just came through a period of time when the Church of Jesus Christ <laughs> has really, in many ways, shot itself in the foot. And uh, Jesus Christ was teaching us, he says, in the world you have to be as wise as a serpent, but as harmless as a dove. And I would say a lot of the Church of Jesus Christ has neither been wise or harmless. And now, if we're going to uh, bring the message of Jesus Christ and the resurrection and his love towards people against a backdrop of very aggressive, almost angry comments and talk about a God of love, those two things are incongruent. And so we have to live a life which is in harmony with all of our actions. Now, the point is <coughs> that these things we're talking about, when we become our own worst enemy, it's usually not just us that's affected. When we blow it big time, it affects our family, the people we care about, the people who care about us. It affects everything around us. In this case, a lot of behaviors have affected the church of Jesus Christ, the mission of Jesus Christ, uh, uh, as he came to earth to speak to the world. Now, <laughs> there is something called a genetic fallacy, and a fallacy, of course, is a falsehood, or it's an error in reasoning. And, uh, for instance, you could say, my dog has four legs, and my cat has four legs, therefore my cat is a dog. <laughs> That might be an error in reasoning. And so <laughs> we have to be careful. Uh, <laughs> genetic fallacy means we look at the source, and if the source is flawed, often the information is flawed. I was thinking about, I was uh, reading, and, and it was so many times <clears throat> in the internet, and uh, you know, it's so confusing because the internet is so reliable for facts. <laughs> You'd wonder how anything like this could happen. But I was reading about a lady who was curing COVID and all this stuff, and I must have got 100 emails about it. And uh, turns out, when they looked at the genetics of the source, she had cured a whole bunch of weird things she hadn't cured. And so people were repeating stuff that was a fallacy from its origin. And uh, now, on the other hand, we can't reject something simply because of its origin. In other words, uh, <coughs> when we <coughs> sometimes look at a person and they're giving advice into our life, and uh, we say, no, that person has nothing to say to me, that may not be correct. You need to listen to advice to evaluate it. So there's two ditches here. One of them is <laughs> we have not been careful with the source and we come up with a genetic fallacy, or we reject it because of the source and we don't take in the information simply because it got rejected before it got considered. And this morning we're going to look at uh, a king who rejected good information because of its source. Now, why do I say be careful of the source? And the reason for this is, <coughs> when you have all sorts of income input, and they were looking at people's belief system. They believe this, they believe this, they believe this. And they took one thing in particular, and 93% of the people who believe that also listened to this news station. 
And they went down the line. 78% who believe this listen to this news station. So you have to respect the fact that you are influenced by your surroundings when really we should be anchored in our foundation. If you are influenced by the incorrect source, you cannot be cut loose from your anchor. So you have to guard your heart and your mind. So watch your source, number one, number two, and don't reject it simply because of its source. It may be, uh, I'm doing it this way just in case you've been understanding my messages. I've been a little afraid of that. People walked out of here crystal clear with what I was saying. So this morning I'm going to say this and that, but uh, I think you get the picture that. You can't reject it because of its source, and at the same time, you have to be cautious because of its source. And I found that word, <clears throat> it's about 30 syllables long, I intended to bring it, but we've experienced it big time here, and that is <laughs> people giving advice outside of their area of expertise. And uh, we have just come through an amazing period <laughs> of everybody knowing everything about everything. I've been certified. <laughs> oh, I was reading a, there's a, some of the attacks on our faith deal with uh, Jesus is really just duplicating other religions. And so this religion that Jesus is duplicating, I went back, there's no history of it. It's created on the internet only. <laughs> and I hear this thing over and over and over again. This guy had 12 disciples and all this. It never happened. It was just some uh, armchair internet historian uh, came up with that. Now, why would we be looking at how not to be your own worst enemy? Because Jesus came to give us an abundant life. And in order to have an abundant life, he also taught us in our owner's manual how to not self-destruct. Those two things are mutually exclusive. Number one, you have to uh, keep yourself from destructing, and number two, you have to live in a way which gives you what he called the abundant life. And in order to do that, you have to uh, avoid pitfalls. So how many of us, and we've talked about this before, we've watched someone and they have slowly, we watch them as they are moving towards uh, a marriage collision. They're just acting in such a way that it's obvious they're going to be in trouble. Or financial difficulties. They're burning through resources at a rate greater than their income. So we watch them uh, and they're behaving in such a way that they're going to be in trouble with their work or their job. And we watch it and watch it and it's pretty obvious to those who are outside of the turmoil that there is a difficulty coming. And then we said, as we watch someone else go into this cycle of self-destruction or becoming their own worst enemy, we say what? I would never do that. But the truth is, we all have the potential to be our own worst enemy. And so <laughs> we're looking at the teachings here of three preemptive actions that we can take that keep us from becoming our own worst enemy. And we're looking at the third one today. And uh, our actions are not only about us. And especially if you're a Christ follower, how we act is important to the Christ community and to the world that we're trying to speak to. Paul uses one example that we use in our 101 class. In other words, he says, look, it doesn't matter a row of fiddlesticks whether you eat meat offered to idols or not. You have to understand they're dumb. They're made of wood and stone. They aren't going to bless food or curse food. It has nothing to do with anything. And if you sit down there and they offer it to you, just eat what's put in front of you. But then he says, unless it affects someone else, a new, a new person who's coming into the faith, and they see you offering or eating food offered to idols, if it would affect them until they think that we also worship idols, then I won't do it. Why? Because our life affects other people. Our stupid mistakes affect other people. But also, if we live a wise, careful, 
organized life and uh, we follow the teachings of Jesus Christ and come into an abundant way of living, then that also influences those around us. So I'm not really trying to give you a TED talk this morning, but I do want to talk about what is central and what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And uh, a reminder that at the end of the day, it's not about us. And I've, I, I like that uh, in the uh, Purpose Driven Life, the first line, uh, it's not about you. And so our life is not simply about our life. So first week we said pay attention to the tension. Yeah, <laughs> you got something in you and it's going off and it says something's wrong here and you got tension inside you or a gift, a bit of conscience or something goes off. Pay attention to the tension. And second of all, we talked about we can talk ourselves into anything, so listen to the narratives that go on in our head as we justify a decision. So pay attention to your narratives. And uh, thirdly today, we're going to say pay attention to the voices of wisdom around you. Now, <clears throat> all of us, and nearly everybody we know, when they blew up their life, there were those in their sphere of influence who said to them, tried to give them a warning. You know, I don't know about that guy. The fact that he's got a criminal record and wears a knife in his sleeve and sells drugs. He may not be. There could be a problem with that. And I don't know about that idea. Or I don't know about that job. And and somebody, usually in our own mistakes, in our own life, somebody tried to give us a heads up that we should be thinking about it. And we were receiving wise wisdom, but we blew it off. And uh, the reason we should consider it uh, and separate the advice from the source is the person who's talking to us doesn't hear our internal justifications. The person who's talking to us uh, isn't knowing what we are ignoring as far as the tensions inside. They're just, in a dispassionate way, watching you move towards something which is not going to end well. So it's a good idea to listen and consider. And I find that some of the best insights into myself come from people who don't like me. And there's a lot of them, so I get a lot of advice. But. Uh, you can't consider how it was delivered. You have to listen to the content. And uh, uh, usually, there is truth in there that we should assess, uh, and uh, then there is truth that we should discard. Now, I'd like us to look for uh, the uh, uh, illustration of this. I'd like us to look into the Old Testament, and we're looking at the first uh, book of Kings, and uh, here we have uh, King Solomon, who was extremely wealthy and uh, uh, he was the uh, third king. He was King David's son. So we had King Saul. Remember, they chose him because he was head and shoulders <coughs> above everybody else. He was a magnificent specimen of a warrior. Then we had King David, who captured the territory, brought peace to the land, and expanded the land of Israel. And then we had his son Solomon, who was extremely intelligent, and uh, he did a lot of building uh, in the land of Israel. <clears throat> and so his reign was coming to an end, and it was all assumed that uh, Rehoboam, would be the next king to replace him. Rehoboam was his son, and so when King Solomon dies, Rehoboam's going to take the throne. Now, the story has another character in here called Jeroboam. Not Rehoboam, but Jeroboam. And uh, you know the books where you look up how to name your child, there wasn't a lot of choices there, so... Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Rehoboam really was the legitimate heir to the throne. And who was Jeroboam? He was uh, a man in the kingdom that Solomon had elevated to a position 
<laughs> over the labor. And in those days, it was forced labor. And so he had the power and authority and position, and he could uh, give up contracts and all the rest of the stuff. And he had extraordinary influence in the land. Now, <clears throat> King Solomon, at this time in his life, towards the end of his reign, <laughs> he had taken on the gods and the religion of his wives. And he had a trainload of wives. <laughs> he had hundreds of wives. <clears throat> and he's supposed to be a wise man. But anyways, he was building temples and houses of worship and places for his wives all over the land. He married the daughter of every influential king and leader around the world. And so he had to build palaces for them. He had to build, he had 150,000 stonemasons and stone carriers. He had sucked out of the economy every healthy, eligible, working male working for him. And uh, he was building at a prolific rate. And so here you see, there's the temple that he built, uh, which was magnificent. Uh, there is a, uh, a wash basin in there, which is 45 feet around, and it's three inches thick of brass, <laughs> and uh, there's uh, just huge amounts of wealth. One, he, one year, he took about $1.2 billion of gold in from the countries he'd conquered. Now, what did he do with it? Well, the next picture, he wallpapered the temple with gold. And, uh, and a lot of the uh, utensils were solid gold. And so he was wealthy beyond imagination. And uh, he was getting tribute from around the world. And then in order to build, to justify or to satisfy his uh, appetite for uh, uh, status and reputation, he had put all the men of the land to work. Now, I threw something in there as well. You know that I tend to be a little cynical, but, and so I have to know to the best of my ability that everything is true. And if it's not true, it's not true. Now, there are those who said that King David and King Solomon were just like the uh, uh, tribe leaders that we see in Afghanistan, they were just a bunch of people hiding in the hills and they were just raiding things and stuff like that. And there was no way that King David or King Saul could have existed. Uh, and so it was just a, a historical uh, made up facts that the children of Israel did to make their nation seem great. Well, what we're finding is, if you look at that uh, stone, that's part of a, a statue uh, that was created, uh, which tells of the uh, victory over the Judahite king in Jerusalem, and uh, his war, his army took on an army of Judah, and they had actually they had a tremendous crushing victory. But so the record of the other countries around there confirmed that King David was really. A warrior, Solomon was really a king, and we find the records all around. And those little pieces of stone there, what they are is the uh, signet ring, part of the signet ring, where uh, the King Solomon, they're from King Solomon's uh, reign, he would authorize an, uh, an administrator, and they had his official stamp that he would stamp the wax with. And so the fact that King Solomon and King David were real kings, real times, real armies, uh, real uh, horses and uh, was in history. So as we look at this, this is the history that uh, Rehoboam went to Shechem, which is where the kings, it's in the, the southern kingdom. And if you look over there, the green part or the brownish part there is Judah. That's the southern kingdom. And uh, he went to Shechem to be crowned. And the whole nation turned up at Shechem, to proclaim him king of all of Israel. <laughs> and that's how this story starts, is that 
King Rehoboam, the heir to the throne, was in Shechem, and he was being uh, uh, proclaimed by the people to be the king. Now, before this happened, uh, Jeroboam, who was a tremendous uh, influential man in the kingdom, had an encounter with one of the prophets. And the prophet met him coming out of a city, and he said, uh, stand there. And the prophet rips his coat off, rips it into 12 pieces, and he hands Jeroboam 10 of the 12 pieces. And basically what he's saying is, the 12 tribes of Israel, God is going to rip them apart, two of them stay in the house of David, 10 of them go with you. And the whole reason that the two stayed was out of respect that God had for King David to leave his lineage there. But the... the uh, rest of the lineage was given, the ten tribes were given to Jeroboam. Now, when King Solomon heard that this prophet had come and uh, <clears throat> made this prophecy about Jeroboam, not Rehoboam, okay, Jeroboam, not Rehoboam, the right king, he, of course, tried to kill Jeroboam. That's what kings did. If you disagreed with them, they just killed you. And uh, it cuts out a lot of paperwork. So when Jeroboam found out that King Solomon had found out, he slipped off to Egypt and he's down there hiding. And then he hears that King Solomon has died and uh, he needs to come back to his homeland uh, because he has been prophesied that he will be the king of, of ten tribes. So here we are. One man had been prophesied to take ten of the tribes the other man is being crowned the legitimate king of the whole land. So then the story continues. As they are crowning Jeroboam, the rightful king, uh, a delegation of the people says, Hey, Jer, re, sorry, Jer is down in Egypt. Hey, re, boom. Got to have a meeting. <clears throat> Jeroboam. Rehoboam, got this? King Rehoboam, I've been talking to the people, and I'd like to have a meeting with you. And uh, here's what we would like to talk to you about. We will willingly serve you. We will willingly follow the dynasty of King Solomon. And uh, <coughs> uh, we will be your servants. And uh, we will uh, be a united country under your leadership. And so, what was their request? You see it there? <clears throat> it's on, oh, I should have numbered the pages, but uh, the one with the stick pictures. <laughs> they got there and they uh, said, your father taxed us heavily. Your father sucked all the working men out of the nation. Listen, if you could ease off on the taxes and the fact that we need our men at home to actually grow crops and feed their families. If you would ease off and just enjoy the building of your father, then we would gladly serve you. And it was representatives from all 12 tribes. They said, we just need you to ease off on the taxation and the forced labor. When we say he had labor and King Jeroboam was over top of the labor, that was forced labor. Like they come up with soldiers and they said, you are a stonemason. <laughs> All right. And so he had uh, enslaved 150,000 people. So now the story goes on and uh, Rehoboam <clears throat> has to make a choice. If he wants the 12 tribes to follow him and they said they'd follow him, would you please ease off on the taxes and leave some of our men home, and we would gladly be your people and have you as our king. So he does some smart things. He calls together the king's advisors that had advised Solomon, and uh, <laughs> they had some miles under their wheels and some wisdom and some gray hair. And so he sits down, what do you guys think? And he said, you know, it makes sense uh, to... Uh, respect the will of the people. And besides, 
the uh, building programs are there. The taxation from 12 tribes, you don't need to suck all the blood out of the country. And so we would suggest that you honor the wishes of the people and be a king and live in peace. And then he does something which isn't wise, and this is where we're coming from. He talks to the young guys that he had grown up with. <laughs> and he says, what do you guys think? And uh, uh, when you get advice, you have to get advice from people who don't want anything from you. And people who don't work for you. And <clears throat> yes, men and women. You have to get honest advice where somebody doesn't have a dog in the hunt. It doesn't have their own motivations about which way the choice would go. So he comes to this bunch of party animals and he says, what should we do? And the guys say, collect the money, get more money. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> tell them this. The king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given by the elders, following the advice of the young men, my father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Those are two types of whips. <laughs> the one whip was a whip you used on a slave. The scorpion whip was much more vicious, and it's one that you used on a prisoner, on a convict. So he says, my father treated you like slaves. I'm going to treat you like criminals. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord to fulfill the word of the Lord that he had spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nabat, through Ehijah, the, the uh, Shil Shilonite. And when Israel saw the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? Hey. You want to do it that way? Go back to your castle, run your life, we're out of here. We want nothing to do with the lineage of David. And uh, so to your tents, Israel, look after your own house, David. And the Israelites went home. Now, Rehoboam was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And so he sent the people out to continue like he had been and enslave people and sent his guys around to continue what his father had done only worse. And so they killed those guys because they weren't going to work for him. And that's kind of a clear message, I think. Now, <clears throat> what's going on here and how does it affect us? It affects us in that when we seek advice. King Solomon, oddly enough, wrote that many advisors make wise decisions. Our owner's manual tells us to seek good advice. We've talked about the fact that we have our own alarm system, and if there's tension in it, pay attention to the tension. And also, if we have to sell ourselves on the idea and talk about it, and uh, then we need to pay attention to the narratives that we're talking about it. But thirdly, Christ followers are to seek good advice. And I would say he was not discerning in going with a bunch of wise men who really were secure and coming to a bunch of party animals about what he should do in the kingdom of God. Uh, there was just something about the age and the experience that they have. And we're back to this point. <clears throat> and it is our consequences are public. The decision may have been made in private. The consequences are not private and they don't stay private. So when we, there's an ego involved when we have to ask for advice. I've always had uh, older men in my uh, confidence that I would run stuff by them. And uh, Bud, just between you and I, I'm finding it hard to find older men. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 
sometimes it's embarrassing to say, I got this problem, I don't know how to solve it, and uh, could you give me some counsel on that? You might as well be up front, because it's going to become public, yep. your, the actions, the decisions, and the results. It's better to just humble yourself and say, I'm in a quandary here, help me out. And uh, I think also, this is difficult for us, but even people who don't necessarily like you, they're going to know how bad that decision was, and it does not hurt to get advice from people who don't like you. Now, sometimes they'll give you advice which will damage you, but quite often, they will be ruthlessly honest and not worry about your feelings. And that's good, because I don't have any of those. But uh, <laughs> overcome the embarrassment, tuck your ego in, and as Christ followers, get the good advice. Now, here's what is going on. People, when we look at our bad decisions, and you have to remember you were there for every one of them. You were the architect and the engineer of every bad decision in your life. But there were people who were giving you advice. Had you listened, you could have avoided a tremendous painful outcome. Christ followers listen carefully. And it's like, I don't know what it is about it, but uh, we would have like parenting uh, seminars and things like that. And you're saying, uh, you try to encourage someone to go there and they say, I don't need a parenting advice. I was a kid once, I know how to do it. Well, I had surgery once. <laughs> How would you like me to do a brain operation on you? The logic we tell ourselves to avoid difficult decisions, almost anybody can bust the logic except ourselves. And the people who need it talk themselves out of it. Now, you and I have to be more humble than that. We have to say, I need to go over the consequences of my actions. I need to talk to somebody about this. And uh, we need to talk about our weaknesses, and we need to talk about the struggles we're having. Why? Because Jesus Christ, more than anything else, wants you to live an abundant life, but he also wants you to avoid the painful spots in life that are possible to avoid if we just listen to the wise voices around us. Now, we're going to have a time of communion together but I would like to challenge you, each week we've, we've, we've had a challenge of what we do with the message. And uh, this habit will serve you well for the rest of your life. And uh, this morning, the specific commitment that we make, and we would come and, uh, <clears throat> if you want to seal it, in a quiet moment with God, he's trying to lead you in a way that makes your life better, if you would follow him. And the specific commitment related to this message on uh, wise advice is, number one, we won't automatically dismiss advice because of the source. Sometimes people who are not favorably and kind towards you give good advice. And on the other hand, we will look at who it is who gave the advice. Source is important. You don't want to get financial advice from a guy who's maxed his cards out and has three car payments and is, uh, hasn't paid for his furniture yet. You want advice from wise people who will give you wise counsel. <clears throat> so here we go. Every single person that's blown up their life and become their own worst enemy, that final decision that they wish they could go back and undo, that decision that they wish they could stop and uh, unwind it, 
started with a series of smaller unwise decisions. It had a pathway, it had a trajectory, and there were people <coughs> giving you wise advice as you marched on towards your own concrete wall that you hit at high speed. Be open to those voices uh, and it will prevent you from being your own worst enemy. It will prevent you from having a lot of regrets and it allows you to make better decisions. So the three preemptive habits, pay attention to the tension, pay attention to the narratives and listen, listen, listen. Here we have it. And uh, when we get advice, we don't always ask for advice. Why? Because we know they're not going to go the way we want them to. <laughs> uh, so why would I ask you? You're just going to stop my plan. I remember I was selling an apartment building, and I knew I should ask my dad about it, but I knew he'd tell me not to sell it, so I didn't ask him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should have talked to him. But anyways, <clears throat> and I'm not the only one that does that. Does that. We avoid people who are going to give us advice that we know we should do, but we don't want to. And so we ask advice of people who will agree with us. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, be open to those people who care enough to speak truth into your life. And the Holy Spirit will give you the tension. On top of the advice and on top of other Christians, the Holy Spirit creates the tension that we pay attention to.